imagine a group of bioengineers attempting to solve a medical challenge by first creating the most harmful and humiliating solutions possible. This is the approach behind Wrong Theory Protocol, a new technique that seems to result in more empathetic and useful design. Welcome to Augmented Humanity. Our guests are modern explorers working at the intersection of technology and the humanities. They help us to understand ourselves and the worlds we create in this digital age. They are thinkers, creators, makers, and academics working in diverse fields like linguistics, technology, game and object design, and ethics. I'm your host, Craig Goldsmith. I'm your host, Ellen Dornan. We're joined today by the University of New Mexico's Dr. Vanessa Svila, an associate professor in the Organization, Information, and Learning Sciences program and in the School of Engineering, where she is a special assistant to the dean. Dr. Svila is a learning scientist whose research focuses on how people learn when they design. In 2018, she received the National Science Foundation Career Award to study how people develop agency, not just to solve problems, but to frame and reframe them. Thank you so much for coming on. When you talk about agency or framing agency, what exactly does that mean? So at its simplest, having agency means you can make decisions. Within that, though, we might think about what kinds of decisions you get to make. Who actually gets to make decisions? When we look at a classroom, for instance, a lot of times students don't get to make very many decisions. They don't get to make decisions about what they're committing time to learning. Even in a project-based classroom, they might be choosing from a menu of options. What president will they do their project on? What biomedical engineering device will they study? And so in these cases, their choices are pretty constrained. And they might get to choose, will I present as a poster or a PowerPoint? Um, but these choices aren't really very consequential. And so when they are faced with having to make a decision that is consequential, sometimes they flounder. And so when we're talking about agency, we're thinking about what kinds of decisions are people getting to make? Do they have the option of making bad decisions that might be consequential, that then they have time to fix, to reframe, to redo? Often we do straight shot approach. If you get one chance to get it right and you don't get it right on that first try, you're evaluated as just not that good. And from this, we learn that failure is somehow bad instead of as a, an opportunity to learn. So by focusing on agency, and specifically developing agency to frame problems and reframe problems, to say, this is what I'm going to solve, this is the problem I'm going to solve, this is what's important in the problem, here are some things that aren't important in the problem, learning to do that well, that's actually what tells us whether something will become innovative or creative. So we know a lot about how people solve problems, but usually when we're looking at that, we're looking at problems where we already know the answer. So there's not much opportunity to be creative. Like when you have to work through a math problem or something, is that what you mean, where we already know the answer and in, the in teacher a... knows that you're supposed to arrive at this solution? Is that kind of... Yeah, so when there's a math problem where there's already a right answer and a fastest way to get there, then we push towards efficiency. But we treat all subject areas that way in a lot of cases. So whether it's history, then it's memorizing dates maybe, or who did what and why somebody says it matters, not necessarily why it matters to us. Likewise in science, the science inquiries that we let students engage in, we already know the answer to those typically, even in undergraduate education. Although in a practical sense, science anyway is all about failing with experiments. It's that kind of iterative process. If I understand this correctly, agency is kind of the free will to be able to fail forward. Yeah. I mean, I think if you are getting to have decision-making power, that, that sense of ownership over it and saying, this is the problem I'm going to solve within, whether it's a science question. And if you haven't done it a lot, you're probably going to fail a lot. Uh, you're going to pose questions that aren't answerable at first, and you're going to discover yourself that those aren't answerable. Whereas simply hearing from a teacher, oh, don't do that, or no, that's not the purpose, that's not the focus, you don't build that capacity to pose good questions, to pose answers questions. And the same is true in lots of areas, not just science and math. When you talk about design, are you talking about designing education curricula or you mean design in general? Can you tease that out for us? 
we're all designers, all of us design. In some fields, it's formal, and there are set processes related to design. So we think of design associated with fields like architecture, engineering, fashion, graphic design. We don't always think about it in other fields like science or teaching or just in everyday situations, right? You might have designed a child's birthday party or a vacation for your family. By understanding more of the ways that formal design processes could be used and maybe used across disciplines, right? Taking some inspiration from the way designers work in fashion or instructional design or looking at the ways teachers are designers of learning experiences, we might draw some inspiration. Um, Some fields really emphasize the importance of brainstorming or generating ideas, and others put less emphasis on this. But by thinking about these different places where design happens, sometimes we can find ways to support people to avoid fixation. Right, so fixation is this idea that sometimes we see uh, the way something is and we assume that's the way it's supposed to be. You know, if we had just ask people, what do you not like about your BlackBerry phone? And we'd only focused on your, that. Your BlackBerry phone. We would funny. have like really, really slightly better BlackBerry phones now. Right. But that insight to say, does it have to be this way? Maybe there are other ways to do this. Finding those ways that people build insight and reframe the problem of maybe it's not just about making the keyboard slightly easier to use, but maybe we don't need a keyboard. Thinking of like when the iPhone came out, Mm -hmm. it was a sort of whole other way of thinking about not even having a keyboard. Your work specifically is trying to actually do this in a formal sense. What led you to start thinking about things in this way? When we ask people to generate ideas, often they get stuck on an idea that they liked or that they've seen a lot. And it's hard to have ideas that really break out. Sometimes we feel pressured to have a good idea, Mm. and that stops us from having a great idea. The research shows that this is a, a challenge for a lot of people and that a lot of the techniques that we use, if we just say, oh, just brainstorm, come up with as many ideas as you can, that actually doesn't work well. It's based on this idea that if we have a lot of ideas, surely one or two of them will be good. But because of fixation, because of this idea that we get fixed on a particular idea, often they're not so different from our first idea. And sometimes, whether we mean to or not, generate flawed versions of our favorite idea, which, you know, does a good job of making sure our favorite idea will win, but doesn't help us be more creative. I was on an airplane reading a Wired magazine, and uh, there was an article on how artists sometimes deliberately paint ugly art and make bad art that's wrong. And uh, it was referred to as as wrong theory, this idea that Degas has painted this pole in front of this you know writer. It blocks part of our view. It's, it's unattractive and strange, but it's interesting. And it got me thinking about the way we try to drive it the best idea and how that prevents us from having really, really good ideas. And so I wondered what would happen if instead of trying to come up with the best idea, we started with harmful and humiliating ideas. Humiliating? Yeah. (laughs) I think that's one of the really interesting things because when I was taught a formal instructional design Mm -hmm. process, we had to start with understanding who our audience was, understanding Mm -hmm. who our learners are. And I think working in in media or whatever, you always want to, you know, who am I doing this Mm -hmm. for? And trying to understand what's humiliating is understanding your audience at a very deep and personal level. I was fascinated at how that that process revealed things to the designers that they would not have considered otherwise. I can understand the harm, you know, make a harmful product, but why was the humiliation for you a part of the wrong theory approach? At first, we actually just went at this thinking, we just asked people to come up with bad ideas. And we tested it out with uh, an instructional design class I was teaching. And it it worked really well. I was surprised by how well it worked. People came up with terrible ideas, (laughs) right? It was a sort of celebration of like really (laughs) awful ideas. And um, I then was uh, working with a high school project, and students were trying to come up with designs uh, made from found materials for temporary shelters for unsheltered clients, Mm -hmm. so clients who didn't have a home. And, you know, they got very stuck on this idea of a box, right? You can find a box, and a box is is better than nothing, right? And we thought, well, there's so much else that we could do. And so we asked them, 
you know, to come up with really awful ideas. And in the in the moment of doing that, you know, at first they were just kind of bad, but some of them got really bad. <laughs> and, and some of them brought a lot of humiliation into them. And we started really talking to the kids about, think about both harm and humiliation. And we noticed that the ideas they came up with afterwards, the beneficial ideas they came up with, had so much empathy in them. They were creative. They really thought about the fact that People who are unsheltered, they may want to be hidden when they're trying to sleep. They want to be mm-hmm. safe and warm and cozy, but they thought about the needs and the experience. They were able to put themselves into multiple people's points of view and think about that experience. So they noticed things about not just the possible solutions, but about the problem. So it changed the way they thought about the problem. I just want to circle back for a second. Humiliation is kind of a charged word. So when you said in this particular exercise, they were looking for bad solutions that would humiliate the person who had no shelter? Mm-hmm. Out of curiosity, what were some sure. of the humiliating solutions? I mean, and when you first said humiliation, I was thinking humiliating the person having the idea. I was imagining people having ideas and everybody going, you're so dumb. <laughs> but do you remember yeah, any examples yeah. of... No, because they were quite vivid. The students got quite graphic with some of their ideas about humiliation in terms of you know signs that pointed at a, at a person, making it really clear that that's where they were so they wouldn't be hidden, right? They'd have neon lights and so forth pointing at them, showing like there's a homeless person here, right? And so avoiding kind of that person first language that we were encouraging them to use. Um, a shelter built out of used toilet paper. Right, know, really, right. really awful things. But then when they went into coming with beneficial ideas, you could see the influence of this. Instead of thinking about a box, right, they thought about a shelter that could be easily and quickly packed up and hidden away and, and that when deployed would keep them hidden from other people. They also thought about things like a way to carry family photos. You know, what if you had things that were precious to you that were meaningful that then were on the inside of your little shelter so that you can see these things and feel not just you were sheltered, but that you were loved. at home. At home, yeah. I guess I'm curious about how empathy came to be part of the design goal. And I'm thinking about some work that I saw over at the architecture school or architecture and planning Mm -hmm. where the students had done the same thing. They had been tasked with envisioning shelters or structures that people could create out of found objects. They were beautiful and aesthetic. Some of them, there was one that was a a woven wicker cocoon (laughs) and it looked so uncomfortable. And I just don't think empathy was part of their design goal or their design process. So how did you come to see it as being valuable? When we look at the popularization of design thinking, it really encourages us to use empathy, to think about the needs of our stakeholders, our end users, our clients, however we frame our learners, whoever those people are. When you mean the popularization, do you mean like all these DIY TV shows and people putting up Pinterest boards? And is that sort of what you mean? That, but we also see in business, people talk about design thinking and education. They're talking about design thinking. There's a, almost a whole industry around it now. When we look at some of the techniques that seem to really help build empathy, people have done things, for instance, where you try to put yourself into someone's situation. You, If you're trying to design for somebody who's blind, you blindfold yourself and try to navigate something, and, and you try to put yourself in their shoes. One of the problems with this technique is that it seems to lower your creativity a bit. You tend to get single-minded and focus on that one experience. And in fact, because a blindfold isn't the same thing as not having sight and not understanding what that's really like, it's hard to really place yourself in multiple people's shoes. And so that tends to make you focus on one thing and empathize with one person. And sometimes that leads to low expectation thinking, meaning if I don't really know what it's like to not have sight and I try to experience it by putting a blindfold on myself and wandering, bumbling around a room, I might now think, "Eh, probably I should make something simple. I haven't really experienced what it's like. So what was interesting with this process with wrong theory is as people were coming up with these terrible ideas and trying to make them worse and worse by adding more harm, adding guaranteed humiliation, it got them really thinking about a range of experiences in there, Mm -hmm. not just one person's experience. 
And so we think that's part of why it enhances empathy, but it also helps you notice things about the problem. And by taking away that pressure to have the best idea, it opens you up to having good ideas. We think that's why it works both at enhancing empathy and creativity. I think that's a nice place to end this segment, actually. It's always nice to end a segment on a positive note. Empathy and good ideas rather than humiliation. <laughs> You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. One of the questions I would like to ask is a question that you ask as part of your framing and reframing agency and making an engineering study, which is how and when do students make decisions that are consequential to their designing and learning? When we went into this project, when I first started thinking about this, with agency, that means making decisions. If I'm good at making decisions, it should show up as assertiveness, as a sense of, I, I'm going to make this decision, you know, some confidence. But when we actually look at what design looks like, there's a tentative quality to it. It's not like we go in right away and say, this is the solution. And so that requires us to maintain a bit of a tentative quality, to consider solutions as very tentative before we jump at them. And in fact, research comparing experts and novices shows that um, newcomers to design tend to jump at solution very quickly, in part because they've been trained to, right? So much about our education is get to the right answer fastest. And some people have tried to capitalize on that and say, why not get that solution out quickly and take it in front of stakeholders or customers right away? And so that's one option. But what we've been looking at is ways that people can uh, spend more time dwelling with the problem, making decisions about the problem before they get to solution, wallowing in it maybe, and staying tentative. And so having agency over framing the problem often looks hedgy. We hear students say, or designers as well, say, well, we could do it this way, maybe. I just don't know. What if we tried this? And when we hear a student instead say, it has to be this way, or it's required, we need to have it done this way, it's got to be like this, they're not framing the problem. They're treating it as if it's given to them in a certain way, and it's not their job to reshape it. But that's what designers do. Um, that's what makes design different from other kinds of problems, is designers have to take ownership of problems. They have to say, this is what I think the problem is. And as they learn more about the problem, they realize, ah, no, this, this is what maybe the problem is. But it's that kind of hesitant quality, that hedgy quality, that's actually really good. And so as we've talked to faculty who teach design, they realize, I've heard this. I've heard my students talk like this. I should encourage this. I think sometimes we think hedginess is bad. We want people to be confident all the time. But we know that the way you talk affects the way you think. And so having a little bit of tentative talk actually might enhance your capacity to think in a tentative way. You know, it's funny, as a someone who does commercial design work myself, that is actually my approach. I kind of call it noodling around. Like sometimes I just sort of need to noodle around with a design challenge. It's only after I've been working with it a little bit that I realize what I thought was the problem I was trying to solve is not even actually the problem I'm trying to solve. You're mostly working in an educational paradigm, right? Trying to teach people how to do this. Do you see that kind of approach, though, filtering out into the larger world? Is there a way to encourage that, I guess, maybe is what I'm asking? So one of the things I do with instructional design students, so students who are going to be instructional designers, because no one wants to pay for the time to assess actual need 
Uh, no one sees value in it because usually people think they know what the problem is. Mm -hmm. They see it from on high and they say, this is the problem. I know the problem and I've given it to you on a silver platter. And with the emphasis that we often have on efficiency, getting to that solution as quick as possible, one thing I try to arm students with is a sense of how to say, well, we can certainly make that thing we, instead of designing it. We can make the thing you want made, but it's not actually going to solve the problem. So helping them think about the added value and articulate that there's a financial gain to be made from actually taking the time to say, is this actually going to solve what's behind it? So one of the techniques we might use is the five whys, uh, where we keep asking why is that a problem until we get to a root cause. We were talking with students about the flu. So if we said, well, so-and-so got the flu, why didn't he get the flu shot? Uh, we could ask, why would someone not get the flu shot? They might not like shots, but, you know, adults usually are okay. He might have concerns about that. Um, he might not have had time. He might have not had financial capacity. He might have had an egg allergy. Um, so there's all kinds of different reasons. And some of those we have influence over as designers, and some we may not. And so if we keep asking why, this can help us get a little more clarity about the problem and sometimes help our our supervisors, our clients, understand that the problem they're giving us isn't actually the problem that needs to be solved. I don't expect that a brand new designer is necessarily going to be ready, but I want to prepare them to get to a point where they can bring this up with people after they've built some trust. And usually they've seen enough examples. Um, we hear from instructional designers, we hear this in lots of fields actually, that there's a, a history of design solutions that have been requested, delivered, and that aren't actually solving the problem. And so this is often a another instance of make it again, but this time maybe it'll work. Some of what I'm hearing you all talk about goes back to what you were saying with fixation, where people are in love with a process or a product or a tool. To me, there's also a little bit of a difference between a limitation of your delivery environment, which maybe can be a given and can be part of the design, and not being able to reframe the problem. And so what I'm hearing you say, Craig, is sometimes a client comes to you and says, I want a website. And you say, why do you want a website? And they say, I just want one. That's sort of a, a, an externally imposed limitation on your design process. That's not the problem, that they don't have a website. The problem is they can't reach their customers. And so you can help them within that context solve their problem. Hopefully. Uh, hopefully. <laughs> but it sounds like when you're talking about things like biomedical design or biomedical engineering, the limitation is often baked into what people know already. Uh, when you worked with these students to help design a, a solution for people who have what is it, hyper-extended tendons? Hypermobility. Hypermobility. The students weren't limited by the product. They weren't limited by having to have a certain materials or a certain platform or something like that, but they were limited by what they understood was possible going into it. Any design problem is going to have constraints. Uh, and a lot of times we're not really sure which ones are hard constraints and which ones are relaxable. Expert designers often will relax a constraint for a while if they feel over-constrained. Likewise, if they have a problem that's too open-ended, they'll often introduce their own constraints. A good example might be if I said, hey, I have a friend coming into town, will you buy a box of cereal? How do you make that decision? Have you seen the cereal aisle? If I say instead, I have a friend coming into town who's vegan, gluten-free, and hates blueberries, now you have fewer degrees of freedom, right? Now it's about, can I find something that fits in that smaller box? So constraints can actually be pretty productive. They can help us be creative because if we have too many degrees of freedom, it's hard to know where to go. We see this sometimes with entrepreneurial design where people aren't really sure about where their inspiration can come from and, and how it's going to be supportive. What is entrepreneurial design? Entrepreneurial design is I have this idea or I've seen this problem and I think I have a, a marketable solution that could help people. That can be challenging because now we have a solution sometimes in search of a problem. But it's also where we see a lot of uh, newcomer designers landing initially. Of, I think I've got a really great idea. So it's, in some ways, it's also a form of fixation. In your paper, what you talk about is the students were tasked with coming up with something that would help patients with hypermobility issues do simple tasks like open a door. What is hypermobility? So it can have a few different causes, but essentially joints can move in ways they are a little too flexible. So they can move in ways that might cause injury. 
This problem can easily be framed in lots of different ways. Although we might say, oh, the problem is, you know, hypermobility, and so that's just the problem. But when we start bringing it into specific situations, then we see what the problem really is. But even if we say, well, the problem is opening certain doorknobs can cause injury because they might move in unexpected ways. They may be difficult to open as you're trying to put your key in and twist at the same time. And so you would say, well, you should just get a different doorknob. But of course, you can't go around the world changing all of the doorknobs you encounter to the one that you're most able to use. So we could ask, is this a problem that the person has or the interaction between the person and the door, society more broadly? This could suddenly be a policy problem. So there's actually a lot of ways to frame the problem. And when we look at how students solve this, that's when we see how they've actually framed it. And before we used this wrong theory protocol of trying to come up with harmful and humiliating ideas first, every student just designed a brace. Well, for a lot of people who have uh, hypermobility, you wouldn't know it. That sense of othering yourself and having a brace on all the time. Number one, have you worn a brace? They're not very comfortable. And then people ask you, why are you wearing a brace? What Did you hurt yourself? You know, it, it's the only conversation you have with everyone you see. And so that's not really empathetic design. And so by getting them first to come up with terrible ideas, they start recognizing, oh, you know, people don't really want to wear braces all the time. There's a lot of potential for harm, right? Because if you have a brace on all the time, you actually are, you know, maybe wasting muscle mass. And it might have a little sense of humiliation. It makes you feel different from other people. By taking that to its extremes and saying, well, what would be the worst design there? Right? Not just a lazy design, but something truly awful. We've seen people come up with things like, with each movement, you end up digging spikes into your arm. Uh, the door is actually <laughs> unopenable and is live streamed so that you can see this poor person <laughs> trying to get in. Right? So adding these kinds of public quality to it really draws attention. And when we look at the beneficial designs that come up with afterwards, they really tune into this idea of subtlety, of something that's going to be protective but subtle and that people are willing to use, right? You don't want to carry some giant thing with you all the time. So we've seen designs like tiny bracelets that can extend in clever ways that, you know, would be unnoticeable to very fancy technical designs. If you have a group of students in a situation like this and you say, come up with the most harmful and humiliating solutions for this problem, what is their reaction? How do they feel about pursuing catastrophic failure in that way? That's a great question. And some people love it and some people really reject it. We've done some research into this. The first thing we've noticed is that a little bit of framing of what they're doing is important. Meaning I talked to them about, you know, we've done this a few times now with lots of different groups of people. And if you engage in it playfully and you really do try to come up with harmful and humiliating ideas, it seems to work. But if you resist it, you're not going to come up with better beneficial ideas. We noticed when we did this the first time with teachers that it bombed. They got uncomfortable. They just recognized that some of the things they were doing were already humiliating. They felt this responsibility, even though they didn't really have power. Not too many teachers have the power to say, I'm sorry, I'm just not going to give standardized tests, right? Mm -hmm. And yet we know that when we really think about this process, this is a humiliating thing for students, for schools, uh, for communities. So knowing that they're taking part of it and that they don't have power, they don't have agency, but they feel like they're part of it, it was really hard. And so we did some investigating and I talked to somebody who does a lot of research on the sexual harassment prevention trainings. It turns out when people do a sexual harassment prevention training, there's scenarios, there's roles, and the only roles are uh, harasser and victim. As the learner doing this training, you're asked to place yourself into one of these roles. Neither of these are roles that we want to be in, right, right? right? We shouldn't want to envision ourselves as harasser or victim. And so the trainings that seem to work are the ones that have a different role, a bystander, an observer, somebody external to the situation. And so drawing from that, we added this framing of change agent. So especially when we have a problem that's going to have a potential for people to feel like they're part of humiliating design or bad design already. We ask them to acknowledge that and to recognize that some of these things are systemic and may not be things they've actually felt in the past that they had agency over. And so today we want them to feel like change agents. We want them to feel like they have agency over that and to spend time really thinking about actual harm and humiliation in the problem 
adding some additional that's playful and maybe silly before trying to generate beneficial ideas. And this worked. Um, this framing we did with a, a group of community planners who are focusing on combating um, racism in, in neighborhoods and poverty, all kinds of different problems in their in their neighborhoods. We recognized there was a risk that they would feel um, that sense of responsibility for humiliating design by asking them to place themselves as change agents. We saw them really navigate that space adeptly. Um, so it helped them see ways that they could actually make the world better, despite recognizing that some of the designs that we're responsible for are already humiliating. Not the most positive note to end this segment on, but that's okay. Still making the world a better place. <laughs> You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Augmented humanity. I wanted to revisit our discussion about change agent framing. You talked about how somebody who is part of a system can work within that system to create positive change, or by recognizing other actors in a situation, people can sort of re envision what their roles and responsibilities are. What are other examples of how this works? So it may seem like a, a sort of funny example, but I kind of want to talk about materials a little bit with this because I think we see some uh, some interesting examples coming from Legos. It's a simple system and a familiar one to many of us. We have these blocks with little studs on top and they lock together tightly. In this way, they're kind of coercive. They tell us exactly what they're supposed to do. We can say that in this way, they have agency themselves. They're making the decisions about how they fit together. That takes some of our agency away. We share agency with uh, the Legos, or sometimes we let them have the agency. Now we might still do creative things with them and build something someone else hasn't done, but we're still usually just piecing them together. But some people look at them and they think, there are other things I could do here. I could take a, a base plate that's thinner and put it on its side and wedge it sideways, 90 degrees angle to a, a brick, and I can change uh, the way they're fitting together. Um, someone who's maybe more irreverent could glue googly eyes onto them or maybe drill holes in them and thread wires through those and, and create something completely different. Blasphemy. <laughs> yes. And in fact, I, I teach a creativity class where we do this on the first lab. We ask students to try to change the direction of the studs. And after they've been working at it for a while, and I have all kinds of hinges and strange pieces that make it really easy to come up with lots of ways to do this, um, I walk around and start slicing studs off the Legos, and they are appalled. <laughs> but it gives me a chance to talk to them about pushing back on coercive systems, on saying, this thing is telling me to be a certain way, but I don't have to listen to it. I can develop strategies for asking, is this really the only way to do it? Are there other possibilities I haven't considered? Um, so while Legos may be a, a simple example, developing that kind of agency, that deliberateness of, I'm not going to settle for just one option. I'm going to really try to think about how else I can consider the situation, frame the problem, reframe the problem, think about the problem from different points of view. Maybe this isn't even a problem. Maybe there's something behind it that's the actual real problem. Getting into this space of, can we just see something different in it? Building that as a habit. 
the example about, you know, sexual harassment and the example about the Legos both raised the question to me of how does this open students or decision makers up to not just failure, but criticism to say that's not a valid use of Legos. Just because they're Legos in a pile doesn't mean you built them. Where in this design process or this understanding how we're making our decisions, do people get comfortable with that failure or that criticism or that change? So in all of this, there's risk. Some people are really risk averse and often want to get a tidy answer quickly. A lot of these problems, they're not going to have tidy, quick answers. Uh, We can come up with tidy, quick answers, but they're not going to be any good. And the reason some people reference these problems as wicked. A wicked problem doesn't have a single right answer. A lot of times when we try to solve it in a certain way, we create another problem. I think one of the classic examples is building a bridge that's supposed to solve traffic problems, but it ends up creating a whole suite of problems that you never envisioned would happen. And so it's this idea almost like the arcade game whack-a-mole, where you whack one mole and another one pops up. And that's why I think there's always risk in these kinds of problems. By spending a little bit more time to understand the problem and frame it, then we have a better sense of where the risk is is real, where the risk is tolerable, and where we're not willing to let the risk be. It helps us understand as designers what we can change and what we want to commit to changing, even if it's going to be iterative, long, and not going to get there today or next week. Not everything can be solved fast. So in that case, it's probably helpful to think about how do I start making progress toward that? Maybe a little bit of a reverence, a little provocation can be beneficial, making clear that the short-term solution is a bad one. I guess, which brings us back to wrong theory to some extent. Do you see people get bogged down at that bad idea stage? And how do you break that? So getting them to really own that change agent role helps. I can pull out the, you know, moonshot, you know, we chose to go to the moon and do other things in this decade uh, speech. If I need to, to really think about what's your moonshot? You know, what's your vision for making things better? I haven't met anyone who, you know, looks at problems they face in their life and thinks, huh, I don't really want to make progress on this. I'm happy with it being bad. And so if you can connect with people's desire to see something better, to make things better, then I think you have something. And getting them to feel like they have permission and they have possibility, right? If we don't feel like we're allowed to, and if we don't feel like by considering possibilities that any of them have potential, it's really hard to have hope. So when I'm working with people who feel like they've been part of a a problem, spending a little bit of time helping them see the sphere of influence that they do have Sometimes that's a reframing process itself. I had a student who was, we'll say, ambitious in coming up with a problem to work on. And I asked them to tackle an ambitious problem that's bigger than they're going to solve in a semester. So I don't expect them to have a solution by the end of the semester, which is uncomfortable for some of them. So one student initially picked crisis in the Middle East as a problem. And I thought something motivated him to do this. Something was interesting to him about this problem. But it was clear he wasn't going to solve the problem he posed. (laughs) And he had no, no sphere of influence over it. And so we talked about reframing that so that it was something educationally focused. Could he come up with some things that would help other people understand the problem and take it as seriously as he took it? So he started working on an educational program that he could do with high school students. That's a reframing of the problem where suddenly he does have capacity to act. And it's not going to solve the problem directly, but it still starts getting somewhere. Because we don't know, one of those high school students could really do something with that, could end up becoming inspired and make decisions differently because of something they learned. You also, it seems like one of your approaches is to encourage people to, when they are looking at whether it's reframing the problem or going through good and bad solutions, but is to actually start to move and work in an area where they can actually have an effect. Yeah, absolutely. So back to the keep asking why problem, one of the ways we decide whether or not it's worth pursuing a why, why, why is at what point is it out of your sphere of influence? Mm -hmm. That habit of just saying, 
is this something that I can change? And the example we used was, you know, this guy getting the flu. If he didn't get the flu shot because he has an egg allergy, I can't solve that. I, I can tell him, oh, there, you can take other, there's some options maybe, but I, I can't actually fix his allergy. That's not something that is in my sphere of influence. But as somebody who does instructional design, I could reframe that as a, maybe we need better education about what are the options for people with that allergy. I can bring it back into my sphere. And so it's that asking why to try to get behind the problem until it gets out of your sphere. Figure out, can you drag it back in or not? Is it still a productive area? Will it have an impact? Some things may be in my sphere of influence, but I can put a lot of effort in and they're not going to have much impact there. Some of that, I think, just takes some experience, too, of careful looking, building up that designer's experience of approach problems in different ways. And now I see here's a place where I know I can act. I understand this is a lever. This is a, a change driver. This sh opens up new possibilities. Fear of failure can be very powerful. Desire to change the world for the better can be very powerful. And it sounds almost like the whole concept of agency is really tied into that self-efficacy. Can I actually do it? And it's just beyond them. The, the problem's too big. Do you see this shift when you're working with groups of people to sort of contemplate their own design process and their own sense of agency? Absolutely. From working with instructional designers who are hired by uh, large organizations that have a, a compliance model of training, right? So we just need the PowerPoint slide deck and multiple choice quiz to show that we covered it. And again, I think there's a tremendous amount of power in helping people understand the impact that that's actually likely to have. If it's something that the organization values, anchoring it to that value puts it back into your sphere of influence, right? So I had a, I had a student who was in this situation where all of the designers just made PowerPoints followed by quizzes. This was the norm. There was general recognition that it wasn't very effective, but it, it's the way things were. Getting her to think about what the company valued, what the organization really valued, what the cost was of consistently not training in a way that was effective, and also helping her understand what were some alternatives. I like to think of this sometimes as the IKEA problem. If you've ever bought flat pack furniture and it comes in a skinny box and you, you open it up uh, and you lay the pieces out, if you're like most people, you read the instructions cover to cover eight times and you take a quiz on it before you start assembling. No one does that. I had one student who said she always reads the instructions before she assembles something. And I said, always? Always in your whole life? <laughs> and she said, no. And I said, what happened? She said, I reduced a chair to sawdust. <laughs> <laughs> and now I always read the directions. She has a need to know. A lot of our trainings, we're not building in that need to know. We're not thinking about how do we support people to understand the import of what we're asking them to learn. How do they see it as something valuable to themselves so that it's not just compliance, it's not regulatory. And she found that she actually had quite a bit more power, more change agency than she realized by saying, we have this history, we have this data that this has not changed anything. That created an opportunity for her to try something different. Thinking about your sphere of influence is important. If you're in a place where you're, you're pretty solid, you can speak up for someone else too. I know a lot of times we feel overwhelmed by the systems we're in or thinking we can't change things, but I'm also amazed by how much impact we can have on each other. How much when we, when we start feeling like we can do things, when we start analyzing where we can have an impact and other people see, oh, I want to have impact too. I don't know too many people who look and say, yeah, I know this doesn't work well, but like, let's keep it the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> they may have reasons for, um, it's, I'm afraid it's too expensive to change, or I'm intimidated by the work involved in changing it. We've always done it this way. This is our culture. That's where this discomfort or mm -hmm. this uncomfortable place that you're putting people through during the design process helps question that. Of mm -hmm. This is how we do it here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's a nice place to end this segment, especially because 
that's our goal with this program, of course, is to elevate and bring out the work of people like you. <laughs> it's our very modest sphere of influence. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. I guess I want to get started asking a little bit about how you approach your research. And when you go to unpack all these questions about design, like framing agency or being a change agent or the role of empathy, did you have models for this or have you been pioneering models? What kind of settings or environments help you study these questions? When I was doing my dissertation work, I was working quite closely with a capstone engineering design course. So I basically lived with design teams, so senior students, undergraduate students working on client-driven designs. They were hired by uh, local businesses and industries to come up with some kind of solution. I had done some work as a side business doing some fashion design. And so I brought that design practice to my understanding of how students were making sense of what they were being asked to do. And as a, as a learning scientist, a big focus of my field has been solving problems. There's been a, a lot of work on, you know, how do we help students solve problems that are more complex, so more variables to them, uh, relationships between variables. We, we understand that these problems are hard for people to understand the concepts in. It's not a simple process. So a lot of focus has been on problem solving. But the work I was doing was about that front end part. How do they decide what the problem is? In some ways, what makes that part harder is it's obvious once it's solved whether it works or not or is good or not. Um, whether we measure it through more quantifiable, seemingly objective ways or with our gut instinct, our reaction of, do we like it? But understanding whether a problem feels right or seems like we've considered all the right things, it's hard to know. And so there wasn't a lot of research in my field that was focused on this. And I'll be honest, sometimes I felt like I was just screaming into a void. <laughs> I kept at it because as a designer myself, I knew there was something special happening. So I looked at other fields um, and the work that was happening in fields where people really study, can we come up with new ways to do design? But as a learning scientist, my focus is then on how do we support people to learn to be designers and to learn as they're doing that work. At some point, I realized that when we look at a lot of the uh, the ways researchers say, like, this is a thing, this is, we call them constructs, right, because they're constructed. And when we talk about your attention, your motivation, um, your self-efficacy, these aren't things that are real. They're constructed, right? We can't do an operation and find them in your body. They're, they're... <laughs> well, maybe not your body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <fair. laughs> but these things are ways we come up with to say, this is what we think happens, right? This is our approach to cutting nature at its joints. An insight from the way we study a lot of those things is that they're contextual. So when we talk about your confidence uh, or self-efficacy, uh, we think about your math self-efficacy or your science self-efficacy. There aren't too many people who have high confidence in every field uniformly. That's pretty rare. So that idea of looking at it in context, we have a better sense of how these things operate. Your, how do we build your confidence in science or in math or in the workplace? That got me thinking that with agency, which we usually treat as just making decisions. Did you have opportunities to make decisions? I thought we need to look at this in context. We need to think about it in specific ways. What kinds of decisions are you getting to make? Are you getting to only make decisions about, will I study this president versus that president? Or are you making decisions that 
have consequences that let you say, this is what I'm going to focus on. This is how I'm going to investigate it. Here are the parts I'm going to ignore. These are assumptions I'm making about the problem. And so that insight has been really productive in understanding human potential to do design, right? We all have that. A lot of us don't get to practice it in formal places. We feel like maybe it's not allowed. When I look, uh, for instance, at the potential in New Mexico, we have a lot of people who have grown up maybe with limited resources or means. They've had to make do and make it work. Well, that's framing agency, right? They've had to take that agency and, and figure out how else can I use this because I can't just go out and buy a new one. You know, we see this with our students when I ask, what's a table knife for? How have you used a table knife? People like me might say, eating, which you know, it's the right answer. But when we look at our students and they say, oh, a screwdriver, putty this, knife. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> that's huge potential. That's everyday experience doing creative problem solving and trying to figure out what's possible. We just need to look at more of the world through that same lens. You said you started thinking about these when you were an engineering student. I was studying them, yeah. <laughs> How <laughs> do you study like? an engineering student? <laughs> I mean, what did that actually look like? What it looked like was... Whenever they were working on their project, I sat there with them. Sometimes they would ask me for help on things because they knew I knew more about statistics. I spent four years working with this class. So by the third and fourth iteration, they knew I knew the professors. They right. knew I knew the expectations. And they'd say, what do you think? Was this good enough? <laughs> so you actually tracked them for their whole undergraduate nope. careers? Or so you said four years? Four years I spent with the same class, so four different groups of students. And so if they were in the lab working together until 2 a.m., I was there with them. That was sort of like your sample size because you got to see multiple groups of students coming in. Well, I also did some whole class data collection. Sometimes we measure the things that are easy to measure and, and not the things we value. And trying to understand how do we measure development towards framing problems, so we came up with this design skills test. Um, we asked people to start on a, an authentic design problem, but not get very far. We give them 15 minutes to and think about it. by an authentic design problem, you mean an actual real design problem, not just something No, abstract. an actual real right. problem. Okay. Um, so we've gotten things from their agencies that are like searching for IP, intellectual property, and they're saying, you know, do you know anyone who could uh, solve this problem? And so we contacted them, and they've given us permission to use some of their asks for solving these unresolved problems. And they're often accessible. You know, how can we uh, make sure that paint rollers don't splatter as much? We can all understand that that right. problem. And so in this case, we're not looking at are there right and wrong answers or are they thinking about the right things or the wrong things, but really how do they start? Do they start by just listing out the things in the problem that they've noticed? Do they start generating ideas? Do they say, well, the first thing I would need to do was go see if this happens with all kinds of paint? There's lots of ways to get started and understanding more about how people get started is actually what we were looking at, you know, what I what my research is, is really trying to get at. Because I don't think there's a single right way to get started, but we don't even know that yet. Right. So the genesis of your work then was spending four years collecting all of this kind of data. And so how did you then distill that into this method? Um, I, I think I can answer that in sort of two ways that contributed. The first was the methods of data collection I was using gave me way more data than I could possibly use. I've gone back and done reanalysis as I've learned more, as the field has developed, as we've gained more insight into how people learn when they design. By having video and audio recordings that I can still go back and reanalyze, I still have access to that. The methods I've been using in my career award research have been, again, really looking at the ways people talk to each other when they're trying to frame a problem. And so recognizing, again, that that idea of hedgy words invite people in. I think I have evidence of students who actually were pretty confident about an idea pretending at tentativeness. Huh. A display because it invited other people to participate with them. The other thing that I think really stayed with me came down to generating ideas was an assignment, right? It was due like October 10th. When you look at the students' work, it was so clear that they really, I remember this one team in particular, they were trying to come up with a way to create a quantitative measure of limb movement for a physical therapist. They had it, an idea of a glove with an accelerometer and a pressure sensor on it. It's a good idea. And so when the assignment was due, the ideation, the generating ideas assignment was due, they came up with a version that was like a, a brick that you could put over your hand that you could push onto someone's arm with, which is obviously terrible. <laughs> they came up with an idea of like this board that you could 
force someone awkwardly into, and then a really flimsy version of the glove. So they just made flawed versions of their favorite idea. And then when I started teaching design, I realized this is really common. Even when we tried to see it happen very naturally, there were moments of brainstorming or generating ideas that were really authentic, that happened when they hit a wall and they realized this isn't going to work. But I saw a lot of floundering or, or uncertainty, and I also saw students build mistrust in generating ideas because they knew they had made flawed versions of their favorite idea. It was inauthentic. But that's sort of a designer industry secret. You go to your client with the idea you like and the two ideas you hate because then they have a choice and it's like you said it's a false it's choice a, it's a choice in quotes <laughs> <laughs> right we do this with like three-year-olds too yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't give them the opportunity to themselves have a better idea mm. right it keeps them with their first idea that probably isn't as good as it could have been as i was teaching design i've just been struck by this idea that generating ideas has a lot of potential that's unmet that we're not really using it right. I think I was just a bit primed to be watching for what are promising ways to do this differently when um, I came upon this idea of why not first come up with the worst, the worst idea. The worst idea. It's like a kind of a weird backdoor into thinking about things in a way that you might not have otherwise. Actually, pretty interestingly, I think the way they approached this was very much shaped by the prior coursework they'd had, mm. which was very focused on problem sets that always had a right answer. I have this great quote from one of the students talking about, I know this is different, but I don't know how to do it. I know there's not just a right answer. There's a lot of ways to do it, but I'm not sure that I know how to do this. I don't know how to tell when it's right or wrong, when I'm leading us astray. There's such a valuing of the technical at the expense of other things. Engineering as a culture tends to be very proud of the technical qualities but it's a human field. It only exists because of human need. Fundamentally, it's about answering human need. What's more human and social than that? I found it really interesting that one of the students on a team, a woman, she really spent time understanding client need. She spent a lot of time with the client and in the clinic seeing why this was a shortcoming. On the end of semester evaluations of each other, we asked them to rate themselves as well. And she viewed her contributions as somehow less because they were less technical. But her teammates all said, without her, we would be nowhere. Like her contribution was so central to their ability to make decisions about what would be good or bad. But this was kind of new territory for them. It seems like it's really hard to make this happen in a vacuum. A good design is not the individual genius sitting around in her room and having the light bulb go on over her head. That design is a process that requires a lot of conversation, collaboration, mutual exploration, sharing of different perspectives and ideas. And I think a commitment to tentative revision. When I'm teaching design, um, when I have my students do brainstorming or an early prototype, I'll actually take off 10% if it looks like they tidied it up. Um, <laughs> because I want them to stay to you know stay a little messy. And as soon as you formalize and pretty up something, it starts feeling final, and even if it's not very good. And the irony being that in the modern era, so much design of whatever it is can be digital or start digital or can get fabricated if it's a physical object in a digital way. You have much less to lose doing an iterative process, doing a messy first version and a messy second version, because you really do have a lot of opportunity to keep screwing around with it. You're trying to teach them to do that in a mm -hmm. way that doesn't leave them feeling like they're just wasting their time. And I think getting them to develop that as a practice of staying in draft mode and not committing too quickly to an idea by leaving it be messy and unfinished. It says, I'm turning it in and it's unfinished. I think it encourages them to be more ambitious and tackling harder things too, because it keeps reinforcing this idea that, you know, in the amount of time you had to do this one assignment, you're not going to have finished it. And that's uncomfortable. Yeah. I think I've only had to do the 10% off once because word spreads. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. I have learned so much, and I'm going to change my life and start <laughs> start thinking about the most humiliating and harmful <laughs> solutions to all my problems first before moving on to the best and most empathetic one. And if you would like more information about the work that Dr. Svila is doing, you can visit her website, vanessasvila.org, and that's uh, spelled capital S 
V is in Victor, I H L A, Svila, Vanessa Svila.org. And you have been listening to Augmented Humanity, which is a program of the New Mexico Humanities Council, produced in partnership with KUNM FM. You can visit us online and find out more about our programs at nmhumanities.org. Our theme music comes courtesy James Whiten, and we've had production assistance from Tristan Klum. <laughs>